Welcome back, Tribe. Have one here recommended by somebody. It says it's not just you, no one wants kids anymore. So let's see. The US fertility rate drops to another historic low. Births in Japan hit record low. Italy's national birth rate is declared a national emergency. Nearly every country is due to shrink by 2100. There's little to no doubt that there's like an ongoing fertility crisis. <sighs> People are choosing to not have babies anymore. From South Korea to the United States to Norway to Taiwan, pretty much every rich country. And you might not think this is a problem, but it is a problem for a few reasons. The reality is that people are living longer than ever at the moment. When people start to live this long, you need new workers to replace the ones that are retiring. You need new workers to pay taxes that will eventually fund the pensions of those who retire. And you need young people in the workforce to take care of those older people. In the 1960s, there were six people of working age for every retired person. And by 2035, it's expected to be two to one. This is one of those topics where if you ask five different people, you'll get five completely different answers as to what the reason is. People tend to have quite strong opinions. Some people might say it's a cost of living issue. Some people might say that it's to do with declining rates of religion in the world. Some people might blame women's liberation movements, for example. Either way, no matter what people say, they're typically pretty certain that and that either their experience or their belief is the reason why on a global scale people aren't having children. I think we can do better than that because when I see that there's a problem that is affecting Norway, the US, Taiwan and France, I tell myself that there's got to be like a better answer that we can give, right? Because these countries are completely different. The childcare situation, mm -hmm. for example, in yeah, what we covered in a prior episode with China's nowhere women and leftover women, and I was making the case that I think it's corporate culture. I think it's capitalism that's hijacked by corporatism. We're experiencing economic growth through corporate setups. Corporate multinational companies, guys, is like the backbone of what makes a, co a, a country rich these days, right? Who has the most multinational powerful corporations? They then exert their influence on the politicians with infinite campaign donations or just outright being a huge chunk of the economy like South Korea, three companies or something like a majority of the GDP of that country. Um, so they have outsized political influence and they subvert at the expense of the voting citizens, the entire government structure that benefits them, meanwhile taking away from the average person. So if you look over the last 50, 60 years, in all these countries, corporations have sprouted up, grown and gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and rivaling countries now in strength and influence, money, all that stuff. And short term, amazing for corporations. Laws are being passed and legislated in their favor at the expense of family planning, young people being able to afford buying homes, jobs that are in their areas that pay enough to start a family, any sort of discounts or incentives or government programs that help people start families and have children. I mean, look, in the United States alone, it costs how much money just to birth a child at a hospital? And then how many weeks do you get off for parental leave, both mother and father? Just look at look at the numbers. They're absolutely brutal. In America, paid maternity leave is 12 work weeks, and it may be used during a 12 month period. In other countries in Europe, it's 12 months. You get 12 weeks. Do you know what that does to a woman to have a baby and then 12 weeks later, essentially return back to work, the anxiety you get from not being able to hold your baby? Do you think that's healthy for the baby itself to not have contact with the mother? What about paternal leave? I don't think America even has such a thing as paternal leave unless you're in a high flying cushy job as a CEO or some shit. In Europe, paternal leave is a thing too. But again, we're going back to the economic snapshot. It's impossible to start a family. Economically spe speaking, we cannot finance it. We're hardly able to pay ourselves to have food on the table, to even rent a damn place. There's people that are now all the way down to sharing rooms because the jobs they do have are in a city where inflation has run away from them, pay has not kept up, and they can't even afford their own place. Now you want to add a woman and kids on top of that? Shit is wild. Let's see. What Norway is. is vastly different to the childcare situation in the US, which is vastly yeah. different to the UK. So I feel like we can get a better answer than just this one line Curious. solution of, oh, it's the cost of living. I think we can do better. If you'd asked me, to be honest, like even just a couple of weeks ago, I would have put the blame squarely on the cost of housing. In fact, there's this one chart that lives like in my head, rent free. It's a chart that compares the growth of house prices to the growth of incomes in the UK. And intuitively, to me, it feels like that's why people wouldn't want to have kids. And to a lot of people, it feels that way. 
but I want to challenge my intuition and maybe we can reach a more nuanced answer as to why this is more of a global problem than necessarily Mm -hmm. a specific localized problem. For example, this is a piece of research from the US, which tried to establish what the effect of a $10,000 increase in housing would be on people's decision to have kids. Unsurprisingly, if house prices go up, it corresponds to a 2.4% drop in the decision to have kids if you are renting. However, if you own your home, you actually become more likely to have kids as house Mm -hmm. prices go up. The net effect of this is that when house prices go up in the US, more people actually want to have kids, which is really counterintuitive. But there is some variance because in the UK, the effect of increasing house prices is a net decrease. And this is just one piece of evidence that immediately helps us understand that we can't just think of this problem as a one-line solution. Clearly, housing can't explain the, the full picture. I think the cost of having children is another huge factor that people typically fall back on when they explain the reasons why people aren't having kids. It's, it's too expensive. However, it seems that even paying people to have kids isn't working very well. Taiwan mm. spent more than $3 billion trying to get its citizens. Um, yeah, but all those programs from the government were shit. So even though they spent $3 billion, like what a person gets to have a kid does not help cover the kid through the lifetime expenses. 18 years. You need help for 18 years in the current economy. You do. It's absolute bullshit that they'll give you a one-time $1,000 payment or they'll give you some you know, tax break for a few years or it's bullshit. We need housing. And we need some of the old things that were done in the past. I'm not going to tell you by which country this was done, but go look it up yourself. The government would provide new families with brand new homes that were built to spec for the highest standards possible in the private sector. You were also given a 25% off loans for every kid you had. So at four kids, I believe is what it was. You could have essentially an entire loan written off. Very low to no interest rate on anything to help a family get started because interest is the devil. Interest is what eats you alive. I mean, imagine that. Imagine these policies, guys, in the United States, for example, right now, the government will build your house to the highest spec possible compared to the private sector. The loan that you would be paying the house down with will come with zero interest. All you have to do is have kids. Four would completely wipe your loan out. And the society would get four kids now that in taxes alone throughout their entire lifetime will most likely end up paying back into the system far more than that initial loan for that initial house, which by the way, even if you somehow still owe on it, you only have a couple of kids or one, the value of the property rises so much that you could offset the cost of the entire loan by refinancing. Anyways, you could sell that house and downsize in time. It's almost a win-win scenario completely, but we don't have forward thinking ideas like this that are family oriented. We don't live in a family oriented society. We live in a corporate oriented society. They only care about corporations. That is why it seems better than ever to be a corporation in the United States today. Legislation, legal loopholes, bureaucratic red tape, all of that is now so easy for a company. The right to fire you whenever they want, price gouging to extreme levels, making a ton of money, buying, influencing, and completely corrupting the entire democratic process with unlimited campaign donations. I mean, we had Citizen United passed in the United States. That That's basically marking the beginning of the end of America, where corporations are people, and they can donate unlimited funds to political parties and representatives. That's crazy. So if you're a corporation in the United States currently, or any of these places where corporations have outsized influence on government, you're screwed because they buy the politicians, they pay for the campaigning, they get legislation in their favor at your expense, because at the end of the day, it's them versus you. It's the haves versus have nots. That is why you're on the losing end of this. You have no influence over government. Your vote doesn't actually matter. They pay for both sides of the party. They will benefit one way or another. Whoever wins, it doesn't matter. They will use their money to buy influence to get legislation passed in their interest, guys. That's really what the game is. Let's see to have more children and it's had no success at all. In France, they've spent even more money, about 4% of their GDP on various measures to encourage people to have children. To put this into perspective, if the US spent 4% of its GDP on family measures, that would be the equivalent of the entire defense budget. So countries are actually, some countries at least, are actually spending a huge amount of money on things like tax breaks, things like direct cash transfers and things like childcare benefits to encourage people to have kids. So clearly there's a bit more to this whole situation than meets the eye initially. And I think we can maybe look at some of the research and evidence because there is a whole body of research and evidence to engage with. And I've tried to find the best bits to share it with you. 
And I'm curious to hear what your opinions are on these different aspects. What I do find really interesting is like how the narrative has changed around this topic, because a couple of decades ago, overpopulation was all the rage. All of the discussion around the number of people on earth revolved around the fact that there were too many people and we have two people to blame for this. First of all, we have this dude here. His name is Thomas Malthus, and he is an 18th century economist. And he was the first major figure to really write about this idea of a population boom. He saw that the quality of life in 18th century England was dropping pretty quickly. And he said that there was just too many people and that we'd get to a point where there wouldn't be enough food to sustain the growing population. And a couple of decades later, another professor wrote about the same topic. His name was Paul Ehrlich, and he wrote a book called The Population Bomb. And people really believed them. To kind of put into perspective how scared people were of overpopulation, I want to share a quote by the chairman of the Federal Reserve in the US, who said that overpopulation could be more explosive than the atomic or hydrogen bomb. Even on the other side of the world, in China, these fears of overpopulation promoted China's decision to implement their one-child policy, the whole package of laws and regulations designed to stop Chinese people from having more than one child. If we fast forward to today, those fears were like clearly unfounded. I think most of us understand that food insecurity is a distribution problem and not an agriculture problem. And instead, we've ended up in the situation where, <laughs> where underpopulation is the problem where there are not enough young people. And I want to take a little bit of time to talk about the US specifically, because I think they've got some really interesting factors that paint a different picture of the fertility crisis to the one that you might have in your head at the moment. This is a graph of the US fertility rates, and it's the kind of graph that makes you want to jump to a specific conclusion or a one-line answer as to what's going on here. But the real interesting part of this graph isn't what it looks like now. It's what it looks like when you kind of break it down by demographics. And there thankfully, The Economist has done this for me. If we look at birth rate divided by age, we see some really interesting trends. Somewhat surprisingly, the fertility rate amongst women over 30 has actually been steadily rising since the 1990s. However, you might see something else that's quite interesting. Birth rates amongst 15 to 19 year old women in the US dropped dramatically. The actual figure is 77%. And they actually explain that more than half of the drop in America's total fertility rate is driven by women under 19 choosing to no longer have kids. Around a third of these births would have been unplanned, and the majority of these births would have been on low incomes as well. In the UK, we actually see a similar trend where women at age 20 are having half as many children. Unlike richer women, these young women are not going to compensate by having more kids in the future. And I really wonder what a country's birth rate actually is when you split the demographics even more by race, by natives, because, um, listen, mass migration into Europe and porous borders in America is a topic that we have to have for conversation. These first gen immigrants, migrants, illegal, whatever you want to call them, asylum seekers, blah, I don't care what word you use. They're coming in in such high numbers that they're impacting the birth rate of these countries. When you look at what's happening to the natives of these countries, and if you were to look at those graphs and see what the native born birth rates are, these numbers will be far more shocking to everybody listening right now. These countries like Germany, Sweden, all of them that have a somewhat acceptable birth rate, although still declining, if they only reported on the natives, their numbers would be in the shitter. It would be talked about nationally. Honestly, how this isn't seen as a threat to national security and a national emergency is it blows my mind that these countries aren't taking it that serious. But of course, you know, when you import millions of people and you don't vet them, don't check for anything and borders are porous and you use them to basically fudge the numbers and increase your demographic, increase your population and temporarily your birth rate at the expense of the cohesion of the social fabric of society. Go, OK. Yeah, we won't go there, bro. Let's continue. Sure. And I actually want to like take a brief second to have to have a little aside and talk about the fact that often the most, you know, the most vilified group of people are actually the most important group of people to, to society. I'm sure you've heard young single mothers described as a burden on society or as lazy. But clearly these women were actually like the backbone of the economy. It's a it's an aspect that I feel many people don't actually think about. Obviously, it would be unreasonable to say that the reason that no one is having kids is purely because teen pregnancies are down. The economic aspect of it is clearly like important. It's clearly relevant. I don't think it's a coincidence, if you look in this graph, that the countries that have the lowest fertility rate in Europe, countries like Italy, Spain and Greece, 
are also the countries with the highest youth unemployment, the countries where young people economy. live with their parents for the longest and the economy is in the bin, basically. And if you just ask young adults why they're not having kids, a lot of them will say that it's simply because childcare is too expensive. What I do find interesting, though, is that the fertility crisis is one that affects the whole world. And it affects countries that spend an incredible amount of money on social programs for kids. So this is a quote by Robert Reich. Uh, if you don't know who Robert Reich is, he was US Secretary of Labor. He says that Norway spends around $30,000 per child on early childhood care. Finland spends $23,000. Germany spends $18,000 and the US s spends uh, $500 per child. Huh. Obviously, the US has a huge childcare spending problem. It just doesn't want to invest in young children. But Norway, which is spending incredible amounts on early childhood care, is still seeing a below replacement birth rate. And when we talk about this problem, we tend to lump men and women in together as if their experience of having children is identical, when there are actually some pretty significant differences that can at least help us explain some more of the trend towards choosing to not have children. And one of these big factors is the fact that women's earnings drop significantly after having a child, and that drop persists decades after they have children. This is not so much of a problem for men. Men who... Ch this is basically solidifying what we say. Women can't have both. You either choose to be a career woman or you choose to be a wife with kids you can't you look the graphs alone say that you can't have both you're going to suffer in one or the other you have to dedicate yourself to your career which means your family will suffer or you dedicate your life to your family and your professional life suffers you can't have both and society isn't pushing women to have families and to have children today what they're really wanting is more slaves for the debt driven economies that we're under because we need to pay more taxes to fund all these wars and money laundering and misspending and corruption and private contracts and oh my god the trillions and billions and millions that just constantly disappear we can't audit we don't know where all the money is sorry guys while the roads that you live on continue to be full of potholes the bridges you drive past continue to crumble the infrastructure all around you is becoming deplorable there's homelessness increasing crime is increasing borders are porous society seems to be falling to the wayside and you're asked to do more and more and more, work more hours, pay more taxes, have less and less and less every year. And by the way, through all of this, have a family. It's always been about economics. Choose to have kids, don't earn significantly less than men who don't choose to have kids. And, they and by the way, who's the most impacted by the economic situation? Teen pregnancies, teen mothers. Money from where? With who? If they were pregnant by a guy their age, say 15-year-old girl, 16-year-old guy, what's a 16-year-old young man, a kid, going to be doing to earn any money to support his family? Absolutely nothing. They don't also experience a short-term drop in the amount that they earn. Gender-based differences in terms of the experience of childcare, I yeah. think, are, are a remarkably important factor because ultimately you need two people to, to have a child. This tracks with the work of uh, Dr. Matthias Dupke. He's like the guy to talk about family economics. It's his like, area of specialty. He talks at length about the differences between low fertility countries and ultra low fertility countries. In the countries that have the lowest levels of fertility, there is a clear trend of women taking on a greater percentage of the burden of childcare. So in the really low fertility countries, the percentage of childcare duties that is taken on by women can be as high as 80%. In countries that have slightly better fertility ratios, this percentage is much closer to 50-50. There's still a huge stigma in some of these countries, particularly South Korea and Japan, where women are still expected to spend huge amounts of time at home taking care of children, but they can't survive without having a career or they simply just want a career, which is also very reasonable. The decision to have kids is in some extent a signal of optimism, right? <laughs> a signal in the belief that you'll have a a good future, your kid will have a good future, and the world on the whole has a good future ahead of it. And I think these disparate factors all play into a single idea of optimism about the world. There's a really good research group called Our World in Data that they're amazing. They compiled some data on how optimistic people feel about the world. And you can see that there's this concentration of rich, low fertility countries at the bottom of this graph. And I think it helps us at least explain somewhat why the countries that are even trialing just direct one-off cash payments are not seeing remarkable improvement. Giving someone a one-off payment doesn't necessarily make them feel like the world is going to be a better place in the next yeah. 5, 10, 15 years.
On the other hand, places like Taiwan have tried extended maternity leave, and that hasn't worked because that has actually increased the risk for women. They're going to be out of the workforce for longer and they're going to struggle to recover the income that they once had. There are these macro factors like the gender wage gap, which are kind of creating like a negative pressure and it's not enough to balance that negative pressure. But importantly, it's also worth mentioning that a lot of the drop in fertility is actually a good thing. It represents that people have agency. People can actually choose whether or not to have children, especially women. In fact, we use Actually, that's not true. See, this is the part he actually gets wrong here, I think, because when polled, most of these people say they would love to have a family, they would love to have children. It's not economically viable. There's many people here, guys that are listening, everybody's talking. Oh, if I could find a decent woman, if I could find a decent man, I would love to get married and I would like to have children. I would like to have my parents or my great grandparents had, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Everybody yearns for this. We all want to lead families. We're men. It's natural. It's just economically impossible um, right now. That's the issue. We can't support families. We can barely support ourselves. And look, 29, look, it says um, in the red here, it's living conditions will get worse. I don't know where the United States was down here, but the bottom countries with the worst fertility rates are half, man, 49%, 39%, 41%, 35%. People saying that in the next 15 years, was it? Living conditions will get worse. Who wants to have kids under that kind of mentality? If that's their perception of their society that they're living in, who wants to plant down roots and invest long term in a place that's crumbling in their mind? Fertility crisis. When it's not really a fertility crisis, it's a, it's a worker crisis. Governments yeah. aren't trying to create self-actualized, happy, positive individuals. They're trying to create meat for the grinder. And that's succinctly put, meat for the grinder, not families. That's what we care about today. And look, the comments will tell you the same right here. I can't afford a place to live. How could I possibly afford a child? The comfort of the rich depends on abundant supply of the poor, Voltaire. Society asking why I'm not having kids is like my boss asking me why I'm so poor. Too expensive when I can hardly afford an apartment. I wouldn't see them a lot anyway because both parents would need to work full time. Three, not continuing generational trauma and or passing on my mental health issues onto them. Four, good luck finding a partner within the loneliest generation of all time. And... Then there are more personal but still valid reasons like five, not wanting to go through the pain of giving birth, that's brainwashing. Six, and I'm not mentally capable of being around such taking care of a child for more than 30 minutes at a time. That's a personal problem. Okay, uh, but the rest were valid. I'm tired of working to make somebody else rich and I don't want my children to be condemned to the same fate. I wouldn't want to bring kids into a situation I don't even want to be in myself. It's not that people don't want kids, we just can't afford them. Way different. I'm not producing the next generation of laborers for stockholders just because they want me to. Look at this. Born a peasant, went to college, got a four-year degree, worked three jobs simultaneously for years, still a peasant. Realized I'm a forever poor corporate slave. Life is too hard. I love my unborn child too much to bring them into this world where they too will be a peasant corporate slave. Life is awful when you're poor, enslaved and exploited. Gee, I wonder why no one wants to bring children into this mess. They're not worried about us. They're worried that their chief workforce will banish. As a Taiwanese woman who doesn't want, who doesn't have kids, I would like to tell you it's mainly because the working environment here is simply bad. Children are forced to enter a very competitive education system as early as possible. And I don't want anybody to experience the same struggle I did. Another one, it's all work culture. Why would I want my kids to work a meaningless job that brings them no joy so a boss can buy another luxury vehicle? No thanks. Fewer people are willing to pretend it's okay to raise a struggling family. The wolves are complaining that the sheep aren't breeding. I married my best friend and we have no kids. We want kids, but the harsh reality of bringing a little one into a world that seems to be actively working against them is just not worth it. Look, at, look my boyfriend and I have been together for 18 years. We can't afford to get married. I would lose my medical insurance. We can't afford a house. We're waiting to inherit a house from his family member. I worked for about 15 years after college in a number of different jobs that span multiple years. Never had benefits, never earned more than minimum wage. He has a literal Nepo job through his dad, a huge leg up. We both want to be parents. I've wanted to be a mom for the past 10 years. We even have names picked out for our future kids. A few weeks ago, my boyfriend went through our finances, looked at his taxes. He put his head in his hands and let out a huge sigh. He told me he doesn't make enough to afford kids. He doesn't know how we'll ever be able to have them. It killed a part of my soul seeing him feel so ashamed, thinking that he's essentially failing as a man. With 40 years old creeping up on me, I'm starting to accept that we'll never be parents. I'm going to end it on that. Thank you guys for tuning in. 
If you have, follow the second channel. I post the videos up here. It's called Borefic. Appreciate everybody that's joining us on the private community calls, everybody that's doing the private consultations, and everybody buying shirts. It helps support the channel directly. We'd love to have you on the calls, share some wisdom, new perspectives. And again, it's kind of a heavy one. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. And what are the reasons you don't have kids yet? And we'll see if it aligns with a lot of what I've just read and what we've just seen. And some theories about why this is happening in different societies all around the world with completely different value systems. See you guys on the next one.